Will you turn with me uh, today then to Revelation chapter 4, and we'll be reflecting on, on the passage that Roberta read to us. We want to think on the theme today for a time, spiritual vision or spiritual focus. The moment that we become a Christian, the moment that our sins are forgiven and we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we begin a journey. And that journey is a spiritual journey. And on that journey, we need to keep our spiritual focus. And it's a journey by faith because we're saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God not of ourselves. And so each one of us who are Christians today are on that journey. You may be a Christian a week or a month or a year or 10 years or 30 years or 40 years. We're all on that journey. And it's a spiritual journey because we read in Romans that the just shall live by faith. And on that journey, our faith is always under attack because we're in a spiritual warfare. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that would be easy to see, but against principality and power and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places that seek to divert us on that journey, that seek to hold us back from following the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the challenge to to my life and your life this morning is, where is my focus today? What am I looking to? Who am I looking to? Charles Spurgeon, that uh, great Baptist preacher of the past, had this weak quote. He said, when I look in to my own resources, to my own strength, to what I am, I am depressed. He says, when I look out around me, I am under pressure, but when I look up, I am blessed. When I look in, I am depressed. When I look out, I am oppressed or under pressure. When I look up, I am blessed. And so this morning, we look up. We look to our Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus is on him. And as we have our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, something happens in our lives always. Something happens in our lives always. We're brought to the place of surrender. That's a wonderful place to be. It's the healthiest place to be. It's the safest place to be as a Christian, surrendered to Jesus. The Apostle John writes Revelation during his imprisonment in the island of Patmos. Satan, through the Roman powers of the day, I think it was Domitian that was the emperor at that time, had him exiled because of his faith in Jesus and because of his, his, his stand on the Word of God. But there God, in his sovereignty, uh, gave John this book of Revelation. He was in the island of Patmos. Read that in chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, on his spiritual journey. On his spiritual journey. Where are you this morning on your spiritual journey? Maybe you're on the mountain. That's a good place to be. Maybe you're in the valley and it's going very tough. But you're on the spiritual journey. Wherever we are, let's keep going. This book was believed uh, to have been written around 95 A.D., And John, of course, being the apostle who also wrote the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. And the church at this time was under severe persecution. 
under Roman emperors. There was Nero, there was Domitian, and there was Tacitus over a period of 54 AD to 120 AD. That was the, the span of these emperors. And Christians were persecuted because they would not worship the gods of Rome. They would not worship the emperor or any of the other gods of Rome. So in studying this book um, of Revelation, we must, in interpretation, recognize, first of all, the literal meaning. When you look at Revelation, you've got to look at the literal meaning, which is the exact meaning. We've got to look at the symbolic meaning, which is what that represents. We've got to bear in mind the historical meaning for the past. We've got to bear in mind the present meaning for today. And we've got to bear in mind the futuristic meaning, what is still to come. So we have the literal meaning, we have the symbolic meaning, we have the historical meaning, we have the present meaning, and we have the futuristic meaning. So let's look then at spiritual vision this morning, or our spiritual focus. About six years after the Lord Jesus had ascended to heaven, to the heavenly throne, his disciple and only remaining apostle John was in exile on the island of Patmos. And as he gazed across the sea to the shore of Asia, he could almost see the seven churches that he had left in deep distress. Ephesus, the laboring church, they left their first love. He could almost see Smyrna, the persecuted church. Pergamum, experiencing spiritual conflict where the false prophets were invading. Thyatira, they had, they had love and service and patience, but tolerated also false teaching. Sardis, they had a name that they lived, but they were spiritually dead. Philadelphia, the faithful church, they had a little strength. Then Laodicea, the back sliding church, they were neither hot nor cold. So there's the context. These are the churches that John had written to. And the vision John receives from the Lord is for the seven churches of his day and for the church in every age until the return of Christ. That's very important. It was for the church then, and it's for the church now. John has already seen the Lord in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, a picture of Jesus among his people. He's always here. He's always with us, according to his promise. But he now sees something else. He sees the open door. He sees an open door, chapter 4, verse 1. A door standing open where? In heaven. He sees an open door in heaven. And it's significant to remember that in former times, the Lord had opened the windows of heaven. Remember to pour out judgment in Genesis 11. To pour out blessing in Malachi 3. To give manna to Israel. The vision to Ezekiel. When the Holy Spirit came on Jesus in Matthew 3, 16. Remember, of course, that the door was closed when Adam and Eve sinned. But there was these periods when the door opened. And, of course, the door is open today through Jesus. And his finished work, his life, which was perfect. A perfect substitute for our fallen life. His death, which was efficacious and atoning to take away our sin. And his resurrection, which was triumphant. And he said, I am the door. I am the way. Then he sees the open door. Then he hears a voice like a trumpet. Come up here, and I will show you things that must take place. God is the God of revelation. 
revealing himself. A message for the church then, brothers and sisters. A message for the church now. Yes, a message for us individually this morning. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that wonderful? Why? Because it's a living word. It's the living word. A message for the seven churches then, a message for the church in the twin, just now in our 21st century, and a message for us as individuals. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the way the only way to heaven. There's a wee phrase that's very subtle today where you hear people saying Jesus is a way to heaven. No, no. He's not a way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. He's the way to heaven. So John sees the open door. What an experience. But then he sees the one true God. He says in verse 2, At once I was in the Spirit... John was immediately in the spirit. This was a spiritual ascent. John was lifted, as it were, in the spirit. His whole consciousness was severed from the world on connection with it and lifted into a higher state where he was controlled entirely by the spirit. John has seen the church previously, in all its varied needs. And now he sees the throne. Now he sees the throne. His focus now is on the throne. A throne in heaven, verse 2, with someone sitting on it. Heaven is God's throne, and earth is his footstool. And this reminded John of God's sovereign reign and control, and how he needed to be reminded of it, and how the church in the first century needed to be reminded of it. And dear friends, how in the 21st century we need to be reminded of it, that God is in sovereign control. The first century church needed to know it, and so do we. Heaven is God's throne, earth is his footstool. This vision to remind believers of God's rule and control in their lives and in the world. But then, not only does John see the open door, not only does he see the throne with someone sitting on it, but now he goes on to show a description of the ruler in verse 3. John describes no form, but describes what he saw as two brilliantly flashing gems of splendor and beauty, the jasper and the carnelian stone. The jasper and the carnelian stone. What is John to learn from this? What is the church to learn from this? What are we to learn from this? It's so, it's so meaningful. The jasper is a clear stone, clear as crystal. We read in, in Revelation 21, verse 11. The meaning his person, God's person. God is pure, absolute, intrinsic purity. Righteous and holy. His purposes are crystal clear according to his character. Regarding his church, his purposes are crystal clear. Regarding his church, and the world, and the universe. So John has this focus. He sees this. Now, the jasper is like a sparkling white diamond. You can picture a sparkling white diamond. In human terms, diamonds are precious. The scripture says, to you who believe, he is precious. Precious. And of course, we are precious to him. So John is fixing our focus, our vision, on the Lord who is holy, who is precious, and whose purposes are clear. There's no ambiguity in God's purposes. They're always clear. 
But then he sees the carnelian stone. The one on the throne, verse 3, appeared also like a carnelian stone. This stone is a fiery red color, the symbol of God as the God of justice and of the God, the God of judgment. Psalm 89, justice and judgment are the foundation of his throne. Psalm 97, verse 2 and 3, from him comes fire that burns up his adversaries. Evil will ultimately be destroyed. That's the meaning. And the church is to recognize afresh the character of God and the purposes of God and that vengeance belongs to him. And so this morning, let us grasp afresh the, the wonder of the Lord and anchor our faith and our focus on him. But then in verse 3, we read something else. He sees a rainbow round the throne like an emerald. Now, the emerald is a stone of a beautiful velvet green color. There was this halo around the throne, a rainbow around the throne like an emerald. What did that teach John? What did that have to say to the churches in Asia? It pointed to refreshing. When we come to worship, when we come under the sound of the word, something happens in us. We're refreshed. God comes to refresh us. And this teaches us how the promises of God to his people come with refreshing. Something happens in us as the word comes to us. The refreshment of truth. No wonder Satan hates truth. No wonder his battleground through the centuries was to rob God's people of truth, to divert them from the inerrancy of the word, to create all kinds of confusion. God's truth comes with refreshing as we receive it. Now, the rainbow in the sky is very interesting. Remember the rainbow in the sky in Genesis spoke of God's covenant with man. He set the rainbow in the sky that he would never uh, destroy the earth again. Remember that week, children's chorus, whenever you see a rainbow, whenever you see a rainbow, whenever you see a rainbow, remember, God is love. Now, the rainbow around the throne shows the fulfillment of that covenant. The fulfillment of that covenant in and through the Lord Jesus Christ the fulfillment of a God of love, the God of holiness, the God of majesty, the God of justice, and the God of judgment. And then John sees four creatures around the throne. There's so much in this, but we just want to move through it lately. Creatures around the throne, living creatures. The first is like a lion. What does that mean for the church? The lion points to the highest type of courage and power, divine government, God's omnipotent and he is all-powerful. And Christ died to save us. He now lives to keep us. The Roman emperors thought they had power, but they don't really. God is omnipotent. The second creature was like an ox. What does that mean for the church and for John? Pointing to strength and stability. The Word gives us stability as we stand on it. It gives us a strength in our weakness because that's where God meets us, in our weakness. Alexander McLaren, that godly minister of the past 19th century, he said this. He said, only he who can say, the Lord is the strength of my life, can say, of whom? shall I be afraid? Only he who can say the Lord is the strength of my life can say, of whom shall I be afraid? The third creature had the face like a man. God identifying himself with us, with humankind. The fourth creature, we have no time to go into, it was like a flying eagle. 
God above and over all things. I've seen the eagle soaring, eh? Soaring at tremendous heights above everything else. And its eyes can spot anything from a distance. God sees everything. God above over all things. And so the four living creatures had six wings. Think of Isaiah 6. They covered their face, profound reverence. They covered their feet, modesty. They were full of eyes depicting the all-seeing God. And so the churches in Asia, through the revelation, are are encouraged and instructed to keep their focus on the Lord, to trust Him as the sovereign one who loves them and who is always in control. What of you this morning? What of me? Got to say, Lord, help me. Help us to keep our focus when there's so much pressure in the world today to divert us and to distract us and to confuse us. God is not a God of confusion. May we, in the light of God's word, come afresh to Jesus this morning for cleansing and forgiveness. That his word would come with refreshing. And if we have drifted from him, may we come back to him. If we have grown cold, like one of the churches in Asia, let's come back to him. If we've lost our first love, let's renew it today. If we've been under spiritual attack, I don't know. If we've been under spiritual attack, where Satan has tried to undermine your faith, let's recommit ourselves to God and trust him. Let's give ourselves. Remember we thought at the beginning when our focus is on Jesus, we're in the place of surrender. Ask God to enable us to accept his rule in our lives, to accept that wherever we are this morning, not only is he with us, but you know he's gone ahead of us. You know, whatever you're going through, Remember this, he's gone through it ahead of you. He's ahead of you. He's bore it for you. He's bearing it with you. Among the stories of great revivals in Scotland, the story is told of a devout preacher who traveled on his pony, no cars in those days, and stopped at a small hotel. He talked to the atelier's daughter about her soul. Talked to her about her soul and about Jesus. But she didn't accept Christ as her Savior. The preacher asked her to daily offer a prayer to God. And he said, Offer this prayer. Say to the Lord, Lord, show me thyself. Sorry, he said, Lord, show me myself. On his return some time later, the girl seemed more subdued, very subdued. She could only see her sinfulness. The preacher spoke of Christ, but she didn't accept Christ as her Savior. The preacher asked her then to pray another prayer, and it was this, Lord, show me thyself. Show me thyself. The next time the evangelist came, the girl was full of peace and joy. The first prayer brought her to herself. The second prayer brought her to the Lord. John received a vision of the church in all its need, with all the pressure. But then he received a vision of the Lord on the throne in sovereign control and rule, the all-sufficient one. The church is the Lord's. 
Spurgeon was right when he said, when I look in, I can get depressed. When I look out, I can get oppressed. When I look up, I can get blessed. Brothers and sisters, let's not continue to look in. Let's not be diverted by being interpreted by the situations as we look out, but let's be blessed as we look up, as we keep our focus on the one who loved us like no one else ever loved us. And let's determine in our hearts to stand on his word and to follow him all the days that he gives us to be a witness for him. May God bless his word to us today and just draw us to himself through it. Let's pray briefly together. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you today that you meet us at the point of our need. And we pray for each of us that afresh today in this year that lies ahead of us, we may keep our focus on you and seek to follow you daily for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name.